Hi everyone, welcome to the chemical thermodynamics packet. Now if you remember at the start of class I told you that Chemistry 102 was basically three main topics. We had, I guess in order, um, kinetics. Kinetics is how fast does a reaction go, fair enough. And then we had equilibrium, which is basically how much stuff am I going to make, right, from my chemical reaction. And finally, perhaps most importantly, which in my opinion, maybe this should be done first. The question is, well, will my reaction run? Okay, so if I put things in the test tube, will the reaction actually go? Okay, so chemical thermodynamics tells you the validity, yes or no, of whether or not a reaction will actually occur. Okay, now before we've limited our argument to enthalpy. Okay, enthalpy delta H, you know, if it's exothermic, that means products are more stable than reactants. That generally is what you see for a, a reaction, okay? Generally speaking, it's exothermic. It's not a surprise that 99% of reactions are exothermic because, you know, first law of thermodynamics make more stable products than reactants, okay? Nature likes stable. However, we do have this minor player in the game, okay? And it's kind of a weird one. And it's the second law of thermodynamics which deals with entropy, okay? Entropy is spelt differently, so it's not enthalpy, it's entropy, okay? Entropy, note the spelling, symbol S, is a measure of disorder, okay? It turns out that nature likes materials to be disordered. Things are more stable the more disordered they are. Sounds weird, but it's a proven scientific fact. Okay, now it turns out here's my weird picture of the week. Certain religious folks do not like the second law of thermodynamics. Well, they kind of like it and don't like it at the same time, which we'll get to in a minute, but some of them really don't like it because they think the universe, and Einstein used to think the same thing actually, uh, they think the universe is like a Swiss watch of obviously God's design, right? So we have a perfect universe, which is like a Swiss watch, it's a perfect machine, right? But it turns out that science has shown that the universe over time is becoming more and more and more and more disordered. Eventually, given the final kind of state of the universe, it would just be a very large cloud of <laughs> randomized gas, right? If everything goes to the way of the second law of thermodynamics, okay? So these folks, you know, here they are with their, <laughs> their entropy sign, and the sign that's even more scary is right here, okay? So, uh, you know, welcome to the United States. Anyway, so... Einstein, interestingly, Einstein um, also did not like entropy, okay? Uh, just based on kind of spiritual reasons, I guess. He, uh, he'd modestly coined himself, um, you know, as being able to read the mind of God through his equations, all right? So Einstein had this like, really inflated idea of himself that he could see, and this is his quote, he could see the mind of God, right? And the mind of God was uh, presented through his equations. So uh, Einstein, you know, we kind of worship Einstein a little bit too much. He is, or was in his later years, a little bit odd. <laughs> but that's, that's not really part of this discussion. Anyway, so these folks are not happy that there is such a thing as disorder in the universe, okay? Now, <clears throat> key, okay, so the disorder of the universe will increase for a spontaneous process. So if a reaction basically goes, and that's what a spontaneous process is, disorder is increased, okay? So a spontaneous reaction is a reaction that occurs without being driven by an outside source of energy. You know, without any pushing, a reaction will just go. And there are certain kinds of reactions that just go without any kind of initiation. Okay, now we talked about activation energy and things like that before. Those are all initiated processes, right? So when you light the gas on your stove, you don't turn on the stove and it suddenly lights by itself. You actually have to spark it, okay? And what that does, it makes one reaction literally go, which then creates heat, which provides enough energy for others to get over the activation energy. And it's, a, you know, it's an initiated reaction, okay? So you spark 
is a source of initiation, it's a source of outside energy. Okay, but there are certain kinds of reaction that just go without any initiation. Okay, and we'll talk about those in a moment. All right, now, entropy, this measure of disorder, has the symbol S. Okay, and every piece of matter, whatever it's made from, has a certain level of disorder. If you think about it, something, you know, from the kind of reverse angle, so to speak, something that has perfect order, think about a kind of a regular crystalline structure, okay? Even crystals have some disorder because the particles vibrate against their mean position or about their mean position as temperature increases, right? So if you think about that, take a crystal down to absolute zero where there's no motion whatsoever, the entropy would theoretically be zero, right? So no motion whatsoever, things in a regular array, entropy zero. Okay, but a slightest bit of heat, those particles will start to vibrate. There'll be a slight amount of disorder. So even crystalline solids have some minor disorder. Okay, so to understand disorder, here's my, <laughs> here's my crystalline solid in kind of a, an analogy form, right? So here's a rack of pool balls. Okay, that's before the break. And that's after, that's like a solid, and that's like a gas almost, right? Or a, or a very energetic liquid, okay? So question, what's more disordered? This, where the balls are all spread around the table, or this, where they're in this nice, nice neat arrangement? Well, obviously there's more entropy here. This is high, this is a high entropy state, right? Because the ball can be anywhere on the table. There's a lot of places it can be, therefore there's a lot of disorder. Whereas here, there's only certain positions the ball can be in, right? So very predictable. This is very ordered, this is very disordered. This is a high degree of disorder or entropy. This has a low amount, okay? And then when we work out the change from here to here, it's always final minus initial. So the high number minus the low is always a positive value, okay? So entropy, move that up. Entropy changes and entropy values are always positive. There's no such thing as a minus entropy, right? So everything has some degree of disorder, so its natural entropy is going to be some positive number, okay? And then we look at changes before and afterwards, entropy increases. Changes are always final minus initial, so entropy changes are always, for a spontaneous process, positive. Okay, so it's a weird concept, all right? But there are some classic examples, okay? So some classic examples of entropy or disorder-driven processes, right? So maybe you've seen this, right? If you have some um, carbonic acid and you have it in a container and you shake it up, salts or water, it gets fizzy, right? So why does this one molecule spontaneously turn into these two? Well, think about it, right? Think about it. Why would that salts or water fizz? Okay, so we have one randomly moving molecule turning into two. Two things in the same space moving around are more disordered than one, particularly if they're gases, which can kind of, you know, sample more space, so to speak, okay? So making more molecules, more disorder, therefore spontaneous. So carbonic acid will spontaneously decompose to water and CO2 because it creates more disorder. It's a spontaneous process. Fair enough. Okay. Other examples, now this reminds me, this picture is interesting. It kind of reminds me of when I was an undergraduate. When I was an undergraduate back in, oh, let's tell you the date, 1991, right? I lived in a house with three other students. You know, we were second year students and uh, have to move out of the dorm, go live in a house for a year. And um, three people I lived in the house was Steph, who was an English major, and Sue who this girl actually looks exactly like, so she looks a little like my friend Sue, that's why I got this picture. It's not Sue, but it looks like Sue. And uh, Sue was a Spanish, no, she was Italian and French major. And then my friend Robin, who was a geography major. Okay, so I was the only scientist in the house. Now, Steph in particular used to get really, really cranky when we used to leave our washing, this is before <laughs> dishwashers, right? We used to leave our washing up we cleaned it, but we used to put it on the rack over here just to let, let it air dry. And she used to get real cranky because we didn't like wipe it dry and put it in the, in, the, uh, in the drawer there, right? 
And my rather cocky, I've been studying chemistry for two years <laughs> comment was, the second law will take care of it, right? What does that mean? I'm talking about entropy, right? So I knew that water sitting on the surface of my plate would eventually evaporate to form water vapor and leave the plate dry if I just left it on the rack. So why would I bother wiping it if I can just leave it and come back an hour later, right? So observation is, things spontaneously dry, they evaporate. Okay, what do we do? We turn a liquid which is confined to a droplet of water on the plate, it, the liquid you know, the water molecules can go anywhere in that drop, right? But here they can go anywhere in the house, literally, right? They can spread out through a bigger space, so they're more randomized, okay? Increases randomness, therefore spontaneous. So, you know, if you were like me and you have a glass of water sitting on your nightstand, and then, you know, you don't drink any, but like you wake up the next morning and it's half gone. Well, where did the water go? Did the elves come in and drink it? <laughs> no, there are no elves, right? It evaporated by itself. So any liquid left out will slowly evaporate over time because evaporation is what we like to call an entropy-driven process. Okay, anything that increases the randomness of the product, which we saw in both examples, is an entropy-driven process, a more randomized system is created. We also see, similarly, when I have a block of table salt, and if you throw some table salt into some water and then come back tomorrow, it's dissolved, right? Why does table salt dissolve by itself? We didn't heat it up, we just left it in there. It's because now it's, instead of ions in a very ordered lattice, which has a low amount of disorder, right? They're arranged very kind of systematically. They move into these separate mobile ions, these electrolytes, which take up that whole space. So again, more random. So solid to aqueous, more randomized. Therefore, spontaneous. Okay, so those examples are shown nicely with the, in the appendix. There's a few pictures in the appendix. Oh. So here's one. Turning a solid into a liquid increases entropy. These things are more randomized than they are stuck in this kind of rigid crystalline framework. Turning a liquid to a gas, again, more randomized. So changes of state, solid is the least randomized, liquid more, gas the most, okay? We talked about why things evaporate. A wet floor will eventually become dry because the water evaporates to become more randomized, okay? Other picture, one we just saw. Salt will dissolve, sugar will dissolve, because the ions in the aqueous phase are more randomized. And then there's that change of state again. So we see like an entropy graph here. The amount of entropy in solids is less than liquids, is less than gases. Well, I guess it's a general graph. All right, one last one. <laughs> kind of a weird attempt at humor here. Okay, so maybe you've experienced this. Have you ever been in an elevator with a person? Just you and the person, okay? And that person, let's put this politely, commits an antisocial act. <laughs> they emit a gas, right? So this person has just emitted an antisocial gas, right? And this person is about to detect it, <laughs> okay? Now, if there wasn't such a thing as entropy, that wouldn't be a problem, but the gas will spread out. So diffusion, instead of a gas staying in one place in a small volume, it will spread out to fill the whole volume because it's more randomized. Okay, so diffusion is more randomized. You've been in that situation, we won't talk about it. Okay, <laughs> so bottom line is diffusion is a, is a entropy driven process, okay? And now you can think of more, I'm not gonna kind of ask you to do it now, but um, think you can think of like pretty much any process that just happens by itself will be entropy driven. Okay, now put some math together for this, okay? So the numbers, we talked about it a little bit, final minus initial is change, okay? So just like with delta H, okay? Same thing works for delta S, okay? So each material will have its own inherent amount of disorder, solids are low, liquids are higher, gases are the most. 
the magnitude of that number tells you the level of disorder. So as we saw, gases are the most, liquid second, solids pretty low. Okay, so if you want to do a change, it's just final minus initial. Just like heats of formation in the back of the book, there are standard enthalpies in the back of the book, so you can just look them up. Okay, and if I go to the back of the book, find my slide here. Okay, so enthalpies are, you know, standard conditions, 298 Kelvin. There they are. Okay, so they're in joules per mole per Kelvin. Yeah, they're typically in the hundreds, which is very interesting, right? Because numbers in the hundreds of joules per mole per Kelvin is a small fraction of your standard delta H, which is usually in the thousands of joules or kilojoules maybe per mole, right? Okay, so it is a small effect compared to delta H, but it is sometimes important, okay? There we have gases, higher numbers, liquids a little lower, and then solids really low, okay? So most entrop entropic, I guess, <laughs> slightly less, and then very low, okay. Now, so if you work at a, a change, all right, so here is chloroform, right? Chloroform starts off as a little bottle. You've seen the old oldie time kind of murder mysteries where they get like a, you know, cotton wool gall when they just kind of put some chloroform on it and they put it around someone's mouth or something and knock them out. Well, people breathe in the vapor, right? So the chloroform on the rag quickly evaporates to chloroform gas. That's a spontaneous process. They're not sitting there with a Bunsen burner making it evaporate, are they? Okay, so what is delta S for that process? Well, it's always delta S. If you remember your delta H, it equals S final minus S initial. Okay, nice and easy. Look in the back of the book, look in the uh, appendix. The final is the gas, so that's 309.4. We might as well put the units in minus, and they're all positive, remember, okay, minus 214.4. So the signs are actually less of a pain than in the first law of delta H problems, okay, which equals, and I like to keep the sign, 95 joules per mole per Kelvin. Because it's positive, it's spontaneous, okay. What conclusion can you make? Just like with any evaporation process, it'll happen by itself, okay? Obviously, if I heat it up, it will happen quicker, but just sitting there at room temperature or whatever the temperature is, as long as it's, you know... Well, actually, it doesn't, I was going to say, if it's, even if it's solid, it will still happen, okay? So the solids will evaporate slowly as well over time, okay? Through entrop entropic means, okay? But hey, liquid to solid, sorry, liquid to gas is the most common. There we go. All right, now, a little bit more background on the legendary second law of thermodynamics, okay? Obviously, we touched on temperature there. As, um, as temperature increases, so does the degree of disorder, okay? And, you know, that's the technical uh, description of the second law of thermodynamics. Because if we have, like, a, you know, if you remember the kind of the work we did uh, talking about PV work back in the day when we talked about in Chemistry 101, Q is basically delta H if there's no gas involved, right? Which is most chemical equations. So, you know, that is our first law of thermodynamics in a nutshell, but we never really use that, okay? That's just, just for completeness. Now, wrap up. So we've come across a little bit of a quandary Right now, at the start of this um, packet, I showed you those kind of interesting people with their signs who didn't like the second law because it kind of disproves the Swiss watch universe. Right? There are people who literally probably go to the same <laughs> house of worship, right? Which love the second law of thermodynamics because they always make the argument you can't have evolution because it breaks the second law of thermodynamics, right? You can't have a solar system because it breaks the second law of thermodynamics, which on the whole sounds reasonable because, hey, how can something become more ordered? The whole argument is second law of thermodynamics says everything is becoming more and more disordered. True, right? So then how can I make an ice cube, <laughs> right? I'm making water from a less disordered thing to a more ordered thing, right? Did I get that right? 
from something that's more disordered to something that's less disordered, right? How can I condense gas to make a solar system, right? It's very disordered as a gas, it condenses, it becomes more ordered. That makes no sense because the second law says things have to become more disordered over time. Bottom line is, it's a very subtle point. Okay, so this is kind of a quandary you'll get with your kind of like, uh, you know, <laughs> with your, <laughs> you know, back in the day you go to the coffee house and you have these kind of mind-wrenching discussions with other students about life, the universe and everything. So if you ever get into that situation, right? So if all spontaneous processes result in an increase in entropy, how can processes that result in a decrease in entropy, such as the freezing of water or the formation of a solar system, ever occur? Doesn't that prove God exists, right? Well, no, okay, because if we go back and look at the actual definition, okay, it is the entropy of the whole system, and the whole system is the universe, okay? The universe increases for a spontaneous process. So if I think about that, Okay, you may think, well, how can I get ice cubes out of my freezer, right? I've taken highly disordered water and turned it into, dis into more ordered ice, right? Yeah, locally, locally, you've made more order. But how did you do it? You used electricity from your fridge, right? Where did that electricity come from? Probably some coal-fired power plant down the street, which burned a bunch of coal, made a bunch of CO2 and water, which then went into the atmosphere, which are much more disordered. So on the whole, on the whole, when you factor in everything that went on to make that ice cube, the universe became more disordered. It's just locally where we are in our fridge, it became more ordered, okay? That's why you can have a solar system because elsewhere there's a supernova, right? Really messing up the universe with disorder. Locally with us, you can have a solar system, okay? So remember, it's a very kind of uh, subtle but important point the universe as a whole is always becoming more disordered, but hey, in some spots it can become more ordered and other spots less so, okay? So, you know, my little phrase is when I'm <laughs> confronted by these people at parties who insist that the second law, you know, reinforces evolution, I say, I can have evolution for the same reason I can have an ice cube. And then I get to explain the whole subtlety of the second law, okay? So never forget that. It's the spontaneity, or rather it's the disorder of the universe that increases as a whole, even though I can have local order, okay, if that makes sense. And bottom line is, you can use energy to drive order, right? I mean, you use energy from your fridge to make an ice cube, right? So you can trade energy for order. But, you know, down at the power station, that energy's been traded for more disorder. Okay, hope that makes sense. Okay, now you know why you can have evolution based on the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, stop there. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do, and I'll probably break this into two videos. Okay, next thing we're gonna do, we go into some math and the kind of things we'll see, you know, on a test and things like that. So the next thing we'll do, we'll talk about Gibbs free energy, which is, you know, combining delta H and delta S. Okay, so spontaneous, not spontaneous, will the reaction go? plus or minus delta H where the reaction go. Well, you can combine them into something called Gibbs free energy equation, which is the ultimate answer, okay? The ultimate answer to whether or not an equation or rather a process will actually work. Okay, we'll get into that next time. All right, so I'll see you in the next one.